and we will get to um, winning, but talk to me about losing. As painful as this conversation may be for you as a Hawthorne player and me as a Hawthorne yep. fan at the time, you go to a footy club that's had 20 years pretty much of non-stop success and went through a period in premierships of, was it 91 to 2008, without a premiership. Now, that's, that's nothing for normal for want of a better term, football clubs, but Hawthorne at the time, that was a massive period of no success. Talk to me about losing. Well, no one likes losing, especially when you're training hard. And we did. We trained very, very hard. But uh, when I first arrived, obviously, the big transition period for the football club because they had so many decorated players, but they're all coming towards the end. And how do you retire them off, um, you know, in the right manner? Um, you know, do you give them an extra couple of years just to go out on their own terms? So. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we're always competitive, but we were never um, going to reach the, the pinnacle as we sort of all wanted. And then uh, all the superstars had moved on and then we were trying to rebuild and the club were um, trying their very best to get the young talent through and, and you know, in order, all that talent was um, thriving like they were hoping they would. And, and it become it become tough. Like, it's, like every year you, you set out, you've got a clean slate and then away you go, you train hard and... And you're very hopeful, but um, you know we were just never, never good enough. Unfortunately, we uh, we probably didn't have the skill level that was required. Um, you know, not everyone had the work ethic that we we all needed, and we probably never teamed together like um, like the teams need to if you're going to have success. So, yeah, it was a very tough uh, tough time. But for me, it wasn't so much initially because it was all new to me. Yes, but um, as the years progressed. All I, I got so jealous of watching Essendon play in the grand finals, you know, and, and win all the time. And I'm like, why, why can't we be like that? Why, why can't we be that team? Um, I used to want the club to make it compulsory for everyone to have to go to the grand final because we wouldn't make the finals and everyone would go off overseas and have a break. But I'm like, everyone needs to go to the grand final and realise what we're missing. Um, so you, you have a lot of those thoughts and conversations. Um, obviously in... Uh, 96, where we almost disappeared as a football club and merged with the Melbourne Football Club. That was a really scary time because I knew that oh, I was going to have an opportunity if there was a new club created. Um, what would they say? They, was, they said it was going to be the Melbourne Demons and the Hawthorne uh, Hawks, and you put them together and you get the Dorks, the <laughs> Demons and the Hawks. So um, that was probably never going to work, but in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what, if it does, we're going to take the best 22 young kids from Hawthorne and the best 20, you know, from Melbourne, and it's going to be a pretty good side. Maybe we'll win a premiership. So it was a very um, tough time, especially for the older players, because they knew that if this is going to happen, their careers have ended straight away. And um, and when I look back now, that was just, that epitomises what Hawthorne's all about. Supporters saying, no, we're not going to take this. Uh, great people coming and getting on board with Ian Dicker, sort of leading the way and, and guiding the club from a business point of view. And and the players being loyal because we knew at the time that um, we probably were going to struggle and not win a lot of games and it was going to be tough. We knew that money wasn't going to be spent on getting players to our club and updating facilities and so forth. Um, they had to focus on... Uh, saving the club off the field. So we knew there was going to be some tough times, but um, to the credit of everyone that stuck around, um, we just kept chipping away, kept trying to, you know, be proud of who we are and where we're going. And um, we started to to slowly come out of that, having, you know, a few moments we were really proud of, um, but never, ever getting to uh, the peak, which is obviously winning a grand final. We won a night grand final. Uh, <laughs> But I can assure you that didn't satisfy me one bit. You, you talk about training and, you know, there's legendary stories of you at Waverley Park and I've seen it as, as a Hawthorne fan at uni sitting on those bloody cold seats out there in the rain at Waverley Park on, on the wooden seats and just seeing you run up and down and up and down. And when you play the Saints, it'd be you and Harvey running up and down, almost sprinting a, a race within a game to wear each other out. At its point when you said you were training too much, what were you doing? How hard were you training? What were you doing above and beyond? Well, do you know what happened early in my career? Um, Alan Jeans. Alan Jeans was originally from where I grew up, Finlay, Tokemore. And um, he had, you know, he was friends with my grandma. 
So there was a family connection there. My mum knew right. Alan Jeans really well. So um, I think even during my school days, he watched me a few times. So I think he might have been a part of actually getting me to Hawthorne. Um, so he came down and watched training. And um, because I had that friendship, I went over to him and I said, oh, how do you think I trained? And he said, not hard enough. Huh. And I said, okay, why, why do you say that? And, and I, at the time, I was doing lots of training, but out on the track when the footballs came out and when you'd, you, you're kicking to a position or a, to, to a cone, you've run through as hard as you possibly can. When you've got the footy, you go as fast as you possibly can, like a game. And he said, you're not doing that. He said, have a look at Tony Hall. Have a look at Darren Pritchard. Have a look how hard they run in between the drills. And it's like they're playing a game. And so that totally changed me, that one conversation straight away. And if anything, that was so influential on me, hopefully getting the best out of myself because wow. I trained the way that I uh, trained. I trained with a real intensity uh, every time you know, the footballs come out. And, and you see it today, like the footballers get out there, they blow their whistle, they go, boys, next 10 minutes, 100%. There's tackles to be made, you make them, you play it like it's a real game. And that's, that's what happens. That's why the skill level's gone through the roof. So that was, that was a real important um, connection that I had with Alan Jeans early on and, um, and away I went. But the problem was I was doing a lot of stuff away from the footy club. So you do all your training and your weights. But then even a night before a game, I'd go for... Five six k run the night before the a game. Yeah, and that was just, uh, yeah, and and what it was actually doing, and I didn't realise at the time, but that was taking the edge off me. That was flattening me. Um, you obviously get up the next day ready to go, and you finish the game after chasing, you know, playing St Kilda, and you're running after Robert Harvey all day, and you're just thinking, oh, I feel so exhausted. Um, so I was doing it the wrong way. You know, I wasn't getting the most out of myself, yeah. and wasn't till towards probably the second half of my career that started to do it a bit different and, uh, and really just focus on those, those quality sessions and, and reduce the, uh, the overtraining away from footy. In that period of where you were taking running to a whole other level, so it's deep in a quarter and you're absolutely exhausted, where would you take yourself mentally and how would you keep going? Well, it was, it was a hard one because, like, even to this day, people go, oh, did you love it? How good was it? And I'm like, oh, I loved it. I loved the team thing. I, I loved the connection with each other before we run out. I love, you know, those satisfying wins. But I, I knew, I knew that I had to run myself into the ground and feel sick, virtually throwing up by the end of every game, you know, or the end of every quarter. I knew that if I come off feeling okay, I haven't worked hard enough and I was, it's no point being out there. So mentally, that becomes a very hard thing. When you think about it, oh, I'm going to go for a run, but you know that you've got to run until you virtually can't breathe anymore and you're virtually going to throw up your breakfast. That becomes, that becomes a mental thing that mm. uh, you really have to you know, focus on. But I, I think all the training that I did and all the overtraining, it actually gave me just that confidence that when things get really tough, I know, okay, Christmas Day, I'm training. And I know hopefully my opposition aren't training. So that's an advantage, you know, just all those little things that you use from the power of the mind. Um, that became really, really important for me. And even if it wasn't helping, um, I felt the placebo effect was helping. And, um, you know, you just take your mind that you need to hurt. This is a tough game. It's a professional game. You need to hurt. And, um, and they were the most satisfying things when you could virtually stand up at the end of a game, you've had a win, you're singing a song, you're around each other. It, it, it's, that's as rewarding as you could possibly get because you know you've emptied out everything you possibly have. You won a Brownlow medal, Shane. What is the conversation with your mum? And I only asked you that because you talked about your mum at the start. Like, what do you say to your mum? What does your mum say to you in that period where you're announced as the best player in the competition? Well, it's very nerve-wracking because uh, I was actually asked if I wanted to take my mum along. And it was in Sydney for the first time and the only time um, they ever went to Sydney. And, and I said, no, 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 because I was favourite. And I know what my mum's like. She's like, if he doesn't win, I think, yes, you know. And I just didn't need that pressure. I'm like, I don't need this pressure. <laughs> I'm like, I've got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping that I win because who doesn't want to win the Brownlow medal? Um, but... 
Look, the, the biggest thing out of that, and even Finley today, you drive through Finley, and there's a sign as you drive in, you know, uh, welcome to Crawford Town, you know, home of the, the 1990 Brownlow medalist. Um, so that, that's that's pretty cool, I think. It's pretty cool that, you know, your, your old town doesn't forget and mm. has that connection. But I remember on the night, Bruce McEvaney got up and I uh, was announced as the winner and they crossed to the Finlay RSL Club and my mum was there. <laughs> I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Uh, my <laughs> grandfather was there. All my uh, friends and family, the local community were in the background. And I'm like, that's, that's what it was about. You know, for me, to bring joy, it's like, yeah, of course, I'm super proud. I like, I'm, you know, I give myself a pat on the back. Well done. You work the absolute butt off, you know, and, and it's a great individual achievement. But just to see the flow and effects that it had with the town, with my mum, it was, yeah, it was a really special time. The coach, Alistair Clarkson, arrives at the footy club um, and you at this stage are a football star, you're a TV star, you're a media star, you're a Brownlow medalist. He is probably as a player the direct opposite of all those things. He was hard and tough and I presume you played against him um, and I presume he's one of those blokes that would whack you. Um, I don't know, but... Was that the case? And what was it like when he came to the footy club? What was the relationship like? It would have been a, yeah. an opponent it, relationship, I guess. It, it, it was a tough time because um, I knew that I had a few years to go. I, I still felt physically uh, very capable, but mentally, did I really want it as, you know, did I really want to be around um, knowing that there was going to be a real grind for a few more years? He'd been hanging around for a long time and, um and, you know, you really do think about what do I need to do to get the best out of myself moving forward. But he, um, Alistair Clark, so I used to play on him all the time. Um, right. we, we used to punch on with each other. <laughs> and the next thing, he's now coaching the football club. And I remember going and having a meeting with him because I was a bit uncertain if I wanted to hang around. Just Hawthorne, I knew... or fo- Hawthorne or football? Uh, Hawthorne. Yeah, I, I was thinking that I might. Might be time to move on. Um, I think it's best for everyone. And I knew Hawthorne were going through a real rebuilding phase and I was coming towards the end. It's like, do I have another three years, four years? Are we ever going to make the finals? And that, they were really tough decisions because my love for Hawthorne um, was everlasting, but it was being really, really tested because I just thought maybe maybe, maybe it's time. Maybe it is time. So I met with Alistair Clarkson. Um, and he told me, he said, I'm going to get rid of um, some of your mates, <laughs> meaning the older players, you know. He goes, I need to bring in these young kids who we're going to draft and I need to give them opportunities to play. So he said, there's every chance we're probably not going to win a great deal because these young kids aren't ready, but they need Ooh. to learn by playing on good players. And, um, yeah, and he, he just said, but I'd love you to to get involved and help and, and try and train and lead by example from that point of view. And I, I really, at the time, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I thought, do I stand up and flip the table and say, no, nah, stick it up your backside, I'm out of here. Or, and I just I thought about it and thought about it and I, I, just, couldn't, I just couldn't leave. And, and my mum my always said, you know, don't, you know, when things get tough. You just hang in there and work through it. And that always stuck in the back of my mind. But um, I even remember as soon as Clarko took over, we went and did Kokoda. And that was Buddy Franklin's very first sort of introduction to the football club and Jordan Lewis and so much. So I can still remember Buddy. We'd get um, ration packs dropped every day. Um, and Buddy got his dropped. But he ate it all at once when it was meant to last pretty much 24 hours. Come on, I, I can remember... Clarko coming over, do not help him. Do not give him any of your food. He's got to learn that you've got to balance it out. But what we did, we actually, we found a way to make sure Buddy was okay. Um, and uh, we fed him and got him through. But during Kokoda, I remember at the time, it was just a really emotional journey for me because obviously you're learning about the history of your country, but it was also trying to reconnect with a footy club that I felt it was probably time to, to move on. So by the end of it, I remember getting up in front of the group and, and just telling them how much I've been hurt 
um, by the club and where we've been and we need to change things. And I just remember breaking down and, and totally losing it in front of the group, which is, which is not an easy thing to do. No. And, but my, it was at the time, it just felt like I needed to get everything out just so we can go, okay, it's a clean slate. Let's get on with it. Away we go. So I don't know what Clarko was thinking at the time. He's thinking, what have I, what have I inherited here? Um, but it was, yeah, it was interesting times. Did you meet other clubs? Did you have serious considerations? Yeah, absolutely. Like the Swans, I, I thought I was going to head to the Swans. Um, and I had a chat with Collingwood as well. But I thought, I thought Sydney was probably the best place for me to get out of the, uh, the fishbowl yes. of Melbourne and, and just go to a different city for a few years and, and have that experience. But, um, but as it all turned out, it, uh, it all turned out quite beautifully in the end and um, pretty much a fairy tale, really, when you think about it. Although there's probably 18 years of hard work in between that fairy tale, but um, yeah, it was unbelievably satisfying. And even to this day, if, if I wasn't a part of the 2008 grand final, I would be a bitter man. I really would. I, I'm happy to be honest about that because I just wanted team success. I craved it. I just wanted Buddy Franklin to start improving. I wanted Ruffy to really come through. I wanted Sam Mitchell to keep, you know, flying and Hodgie to really develop into the leader that we needed and Cyril in his first year just to keep exciting, um, not only training but also obviously in games. So uh, I was so desperate to uh, to have team success and it was at the absolute ultimate because when you think about it, going into the 2008 grand final and even to this day people say oh Hawthorne got lucky and I'm saying bullshit because you have a look at our lead-up form you know our two finals against St Kilda and the Bulldogs we had those games won pretty much by half time yeah which is very hard to do in finals especially prelim finals and then we were just ready we, we just knew that if we don't play for each other and and put the team first in everything we do and every decision We've got no chance. If we do, we're a chance. And we wanted it to be hot because we felt we had good running power. Um, it was hot. And everything just sort of worked out perfectly because we just felt that we're a really fit side and an up-and-coming side and there's no pressure on us. Let's just go for it. And, um, yeah, when I look back now, when I look back now, it was a remarkable win because Trent Crowe goes out of the game. Um, so you star full back. Clinton Young, who was on track for a Norm Smith medal. So I remember getting a message to me going, oh, you're going to have to pace yourself because we can't rotate anymore. Young so, had rocked his ankle, yeah. Yeah, so, so the midfield, we weren't able to rotate, which is not what you really want to hear, you know, halfway through a grand final. It's like, what? Okay, so then we had to be really uh, calm in, in our decision-making and the way that we ran and the way that we attacked. Um, obviously, there was a few moves, Stewie Jew. Um, moved himself to half forward. Um, but where all the, the genius in the coaching was with Alistair Clarkson and the coaching group was all year they, they got everyone not only to totally understand their role but totally understand everyone else's role and then on the back of that have the ability to change roles. So he was okay with that as long as you did everything that you had to do for that role. So mm -hmm. that was the genius in the coaching in uh, allowing Stuart Jew to move himself to half forward because he had confidence that all year we'd been preparing for, for stuff like that. And it obviously came through. And not only that, Buddy Franklin kicked 100 goals that year. And Alistair Clarkson said to Buddy Franklin uh, before the grand final, probably not going to be your day today. You're probably not going to kick the big bag that you want, but you can help us win the grand final by pushing up the field, creating two-on-ones, dragging... Your, your um, opponent, Matty Scarlett, but also Tom Harley, dragging the defenders out and allowing space for Sil Rioli, for Ruffhead, Mark Williams, those type of players. So um, that was – and when you got a player who's kicked 100 goals mm. and he was a big game player and loves the big stage, but for him to do that for the team and knowing that, you know what, probably not going to be my day – um, just shows you what a, an amazing team effort it was. And, um, you know, I still credit the great buds to, to having a huge influence on the game, even though a lot of the, the so-called judges would say, oh, he had, a, he had an okay game. But to me, he had a bloody awesome game. So at what stage 
of the game. Can you pick a moment when you've thought, wow, this is actually, you mentioned the fairy tale is about to come true? Yeah, when Rick Ladson was having a shot for goal towards the end, Tom Harley gave away a 50 metre. And I actually said to Rick, he was probably about 40 out, 35 out, and um, on a bit of an angle. But he was a beautiful kick. He was always a beautiful kick. I just said, mate, you kick this, we win the grand final. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he did. He slotted it straight through. And he, I, he gets down on my knee and he starts pumping. And that's when I knew, you little buddy r- ripper, the Hawks have, have won the grand final. This is, this is a fairy tale come true. It really was. And What did it mean um, to you? What did it mean to you, Shane? Uh, You've told us your story to this yeah, point. It, it was everything because all you want to do um, as a professional footballer, you want to, you want to have team success. And, you know, for 16, 17 years, I'd never played in a grand final. I'd never, you know, never got close. Well, I had one year where we had reasonably close. But to actually finally make a grand final, but you don't want to make a grand final. You want to win the bloody thing. You actually don't want to just participate. No way. We want to win this thing. We want to make history. And, um, you know, from a young kid in Finlay who used to barrack for the Mighty Tigers and, and watch all the grand finals, which Hawthorne were always in, uh, to finally being a part of a grand final and winning, that, that was the absolute ultimate. And, and for me, celebrating with your teammates, it's all pretty much a blur anyway, but being able to connect with the supporters as you, you do a lap of honour and just to see grown men and women and kids, grandfathers, grandmother, just crying and letting everything out, that, that's such a, a special thing. So for me, my last game, and that was probably one of the reasons I said, right, okay, that's it, I've got to finish. Whenever I think about the Hawks and whenever I go and watch the Mighty Hawks at the MCG, every time I walk in there, I think about my last game, which was <laughs> grand final, underdogs, um, you know, we get up and win. So that was my last game and it just brings a huge smile to my face every time – 